All right, let's take you to this conversation now. The 18th of December is the birth date of South Africa's anti-apartheid activist Steve Bandu Migo. Migo was at the forefront of a grassroots anti-apartheid campaign known as the Black Consciousness Movement during the late 1960s and 1970s. In conjunction with the Steve Migo Foundation, the Azanian People's Organization, Azapo, is today holding an event to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Steve Migo's life under the theme, Migo is born again. Now this year, South Africa also commemorated 25 years since the signing of the Constitution on the 10th of December by the first Democratic President, Nelson Mandela. Meanwhile, divisions and racial tensions continue to haunt South Africa. Let's take this discussion further now. We are joined via Zoom by Black First, Land First President, Andile Mkodama and Velimbele. He is an Afrocentric essayist and co-founder of Matapa. A very good afternoon to you gentlemen and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Yes. Fantastic. All right, Veli, perhaps let's start with you as we mark the life of the father of black consciousness on what would have been his 75th birthday. Have our leaders and even South Africans really lived up to some of his values, particularly his ideologies of a black self-determination and pride? Uh, thanks so much. Um, well, if, if you make an assessment of um, the leadership uh, that we have, you know, uh, post Biko, right? you would struggle to find somebody uh, who is as intellectually, ethically, and morally grounded as him, right? And not just that, um, <clears throat> the other important thing to understand about Biko is that Biko went beyond just uh, interpreting or analyzing uh, the condition, the black condition, but Biko also concerned himself with uh, the vision, right, of a different society uh, other than the colonized society that we live in. And it is one of the things that distinguishes him. And this is why uh, in the nomenclature of the Black Consciousness Movement that he founded, there is the concept of the quest for true humanity, right, which embodies the type of vision that he had. Now, if you look at all of those elements, but also the fact that um, he was selfless and incorruptible, right, um, uh, as a leader, young as he is, right, um, you would struggle to find anyone currently that could stand shoulder to shoulder with him, both in terms of just his, um, you know, his leadership attributes, but also in terms of his vision. And I think that also has to do with the fact that um, uh, the Black Consciousness Movement historically, right, has been the victim of uh, historical erasure from uh, other components of the liberation movement, especially from the ANC tradition, but also um, the fact that um, the type of vision that he had, right, is something that still needs to be realized because it was based on truth and based on justice. So uh, I, my own view is that um, you would struggle to find amongst the current um, court of leaders anybody who can stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, Biko, Lembede, or even um, Mangaliso Sobukwe. Andile, your views? Yes, indeed. Steve Biko is one of the most special of our leaders. And uh, uh, he was not just a revolutionary, but also a philosopher. Mm. Biko recognized that the biggest problem that black people had was mental enslavement. as a consequence of the 350 years of white supremacy. Black people have internalized their inferiority complex, which of course, on the other side was white arrogance and white superiority complex. So Steve Biko realized that black people will not get their liberation until they come back to themselves. And that is why he put together the philosophy of black consciousness, which puts black people first. And uh, the, the democratic experience with the ANC government have shown us exactly why without black consciousness, black people cannot be liberated. Black people do not put themselves first. Black people do not take themselves seriously. Black people, in fact, continue to defer to whiteness in this country. 
because there has been an erasure of the serious inroads Steve Biko had made with black consciousness. Take the 1976 student uprisings. It was a black power moment. People forget that Steve Biko had been on the dock giving testimony about five weeks before 1976, and it was well publicized. And our people got a lot of courage from the brilliance of Steve Biko on the dock and in an apartheid court. Steve Biko was challenging whiteness at all levels. And this gave rise to the June 16 uprisings where our young children said, enough is enough. Today, black consciousness, it is not a defining feature of our government. We don't have a black government. We actually have what Steve Biko had warned, that if we're not careful, we'll have a government in place whilst white supremacy survives. And indeed, South Africa today, you can see the land is still in the hands of a minority. The economy is still in the hands of a minority. Our parliament is a circus. Black people do not have power in this country. We remain at the bottom. That is why we have formed a movement called Black First, Land First, to put these two elements of black consciousness of Steve Biko ahead again. We have to insist that black people take themselves seriously because the white project, the white thinking process, make sure that we don't take ourselves seriously. And that is why even when our people vote, they vote for parties of uh, white supremacist parties of land thieves, our political leaders lack the same courage and vision and clarity of Steve Biko. Steve Biko is a very, very special individual, which we need to teach our children and their children so that they can come to black consciousness and start to see black, to love black, and to be able to hear the cries of our people. Okay, Veli, let me bring you into that. Uh, now, of course, uh, the country just recently uh, commemorated Reconciliation Day. We also uh, marked 25 years since the signing of the Constitution into law on the 10th of December. How far would you say the country has gone in as far as reconciliation is concerned, particularly if you look at our current challenges as a country? Yes, well, um, I think to just put it bluntly, um, we have become progressively dishonest, right, as a people, um, in the sense that, um, you see, before you jump to even reconciliation, also reconciliation between who and who, we must ask the question, right, what was the source of conflict in this country, right? So the source of conflict has to do with the fact that you had a group of European invaders that came here into our land, right, over 400 years ago, uninvited, took our land and stripped us of everything that made us human, right? And anything that followed thereafter, right, set us on this trajectory of perpetual conflict, right, as the natives and the European invaders. So I argue that notions such as reconciliation, um, social cohesion, if those notions are not based on the historical fact of European invasion and African land dispossession, then those notions of reconciliation, um, social cohesion are nothing else but anger management tools, right? In the hands of those that continue to manage the project of European imperialism on behalf of white people. So unless we first begin with the question, what was the source of conflict, right? Which in my view is European invasion and in particular land dispossession. The notions of reconciliation do not even arise because we have not dealt with the original problem, which is the original crime of land dispossession. So for me, Reconciliation and related notions are nothing else but false discourses that are meant to distract black people from what they should actually be focusing on, which is land repossession.
Mm. Now, uh, Andile, you know, just coming back from what uh, Uveli has been saying, you know, um, about the land question. Again, we saw how this failed dismally uh, in Parliament. What's your take on, on something that also, you know, was very much uh, front and centre for Utatumiko in terms of the inequality that we are still seeing in this country many years on? Um, it is an indictment on the political parties that claim to represent black people in parliament, that they fail to use the majority they have because black political parties together, they have more than two third majority in parliament. Now, of course, the bill itself, the land exploitation bill, is a bill of sellouts. It's selling our land back to the original land fees. And parliament has failed to warn our people Parliament has failed to address this question. And the question must be asked, why is it that a black majority parliament fails to address this big question, which is the defining question, the land question? And that comes to the question that most of the political parties in parliament lack black consciousness. They are unable to imagine this country belonging to black people. They are unable to imagine the economy run by black people. They are unable to imagine a situation where black people are put first. And that is why we have this situation of a bill that uh, has failed. But even if it had come through, it will not address the land question. There is no political party in parliament that is raising the land question as it should be raised. And uh, that therefore makes our parliament a loud, ineffective, useless organ, which our people keep on hoping that it can change their lives. Our parliament needs serious transformation. It needs men and women who are imbued with black consciousness of civil ego to be able to change the lives of black people, to put black people first. I mean, if you ask those parliamentarians to say black first, they will not be able to say so. They will be talking about the need for non-racialism, the need to take the settler in and so on. So we don't have a pro-black project, which is hegemonic in the country. And that is why Black First Land First is calling on all the progressive organizations of black people to come together and articulate a program a minimum program such as radical economic transformation to unite all of us against the real enemy of black people, which is white monopoly capital, basically white capital that holds the economy and holds the land. Remember, from the, once you own the economy, you own everything else. You own the ideas, you own the press, you own how people view themselves because from the material basis of ownership emerges ideas except, of course, disruptive ideas such as black consciousness, which should be by now the hegemonic idea to drive this nation towards total liberation. All right, Andil, I think you've wrapped up the conversation because the last point that you were raising was going to be my ask of both of you, just in terms of if you uh, see uh, a body uh, in this country, just taking some of the ideals that stood for what Ubabu Miko was, who he was and what he wanted to see happen in this country, what would those look like? And I think you've answered it. So, Veli, if you can just quickly wrap this conversation for us and, and I perhaps probably want to, you know, just bring in the, the theme this year that Azapo has uh, adopted on the 75th birthday of Dr. Miko, and that is Miko is born again. So what would that look like, you know, associations that take forward what he stood for, what he believed for, and um, under that theme? Yes, I mean, uh, that, that theme is a perspective, right? And... Um, it, it may suggest that um, Biko or Biko's ideas were dead, right? And um, I hold a totally different view because um, if you look at the Marikana uprising and you look at the students' fees must fall and decolonial movement, and you look at movements like the Amadiba Crisis Committee in Kolobeni, right? For me, those are manifestations of Biko's ideas and 
because uh, ideas living. And I always make the point that um, we must never confuse the uh, the relevance and the effectiveness of because ideas with the weaknesses of the organizations that purport to represent black consciousness because i think those are two different things right and um what needs to be done in my view where we are now if if because ideas were to live and come into fruition is to look at some of the important things that Biko stood for at the time of his assassination Biko was on a mission uh, to get the ANC, the PAC, the Black Consciousness Movement, the Unity Movement to work together. And uh, I'm of the view that as based on where we are now, that is the most fundamental thing we should focus on insofar as because ideas are concerned, that we must have a program that speaks to the organizations that represent Black people coming together and cohering around a program and a vision to make sure that we restore native control in this country, because as things stand, we as the natives are tenants in the land of our ancestors. And that's why we are the ones who, who complain perpetually from the president to the ministers, the CEOs, black people, the natives co complain perpetually about being ill-treated uh, about the minority. And that is because we don't have a unifying program that is founded on black consciousness and black unity. We need that more than ever before. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and for your contribution in remembering Uta Dumbiko on this day, the day that he would have turned 75. Thank you so much for your time.